Good day. Yesterday's announcement by Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu of the capture of Marinka, this bitterly contested town close to Donetsk City, um, has elicited the usual predictable reactions from the Ukrainian side. Specifically, there's been a number of comments from General Zaluzhny, the commander-in-chief of Ukrainians, Ukraine's military, who continues, gives every impression of continuing to be in a major tussle with President Zelensky. But anyway, General Zelensky first of all, denied that the Russians are in complete control of Marinka. He said that the Ukrainians continue to hold positions on the western outskirts. I can remember Ukrainian officials making identical claims following the fall of Bakhmut. They claimed for several days and weeks that there were parts of Bakhmut where Ukrainian troops were still located. They refused to acknowledge the fact that Bakhmut had fallen. And as has been pointed out by several people recently, in the case of President Zelensky, he has never formally admitted to the fact that Bakhmut has indeed fallen. Well, here we see General Zeluzhny essentially doing the same thing. Marinka has fallen, except it hasn't. He accepts that the Russians are in control of most of it. But no, he says, they're not in complete control of all of it. Now, he is wrong. And how do we know that he is wrong? Well, first of all, lots of Ukrainian bloggers, and reporters. And let me repeat a point I've made in the past. Many Ukrainian reporters and bloggers from the front line are actually reliable sources. They are, they are actually extremely good war reporters. Anyway, they all report that Marinka has indeed fallen. And in fact, we're getting a whole series of reports now from the battlefronts, which point to further Russian advances in the Marinka area beyond the town itself. And we learned that the Russians are now pushing hard towards a village called Yergevka, which is located somewhere to the west of Marinka. Apparently, this is supposedly a difficult place to capture, but the Russians allegedly have already entered it and they're already in control of several of the houses there and they seem to be pushing beyond Yurgevka or intending to push beyond Yurgevka to other places including a place called Kurahovo which again as somebody who's not skilled at understanding maps I'm not going to pretend that I'm familiar with or have much knowledge of the local geography, but it does seem that Kurakovo is an important um, position of the Ukrainian forces, and it's already starting to be seen as a frontline position following the Russian advance from Marinka, and apparently the Ukrainian Postal Service, because it sees it now as a frontline town, no longer, no longer sends or collects mail from there. So, overwhelming evidence that the Russians do indeed control Marinka. And the Russians have been making some claims about what that means in practice. And there's a report about this in the news agency, from the news agency TASS. And it's um, references... Uh, an advisor of Denis Pushilin, the head of the Donetsk People's Republic, someone known as Igor Kimakovsky. I will admit I'm not familiar with this gentleman. In the past, the person we've heard most from, um, who is an advisor of Denis Pushilin, is Jan Gagin. But anyway, this is someone else. And this is what TASS reports Igor Kimakovsky essay. After liberating Marinka, Russian troops 
have got the opportunity to block several highways that are of strategic importance and are used for ammunition supplies to the Ukrainian armed forces, a high-ranking Donetsk People's Republic official has said. The takeover of uh, Marinka will allow us to block several strategically important highways used by the enemy to ensure cohesion amongst its military units and to bring in new manpower and ammunition, said Igor Kimakovsky, an advisor to the head of the Donetsk People's Republic. He added that after the liberation of Marinka, Russian troops received an opportunity, that's an interesting choice of words, an opportunity, not an order, just an opportunity, an opportunity to advance towards Kurachovo, this is the place I've just been referring to, Krasnogorovka and Vugledar. Now, Krasnogorovka is a place I have not mentioned before. There, are in, there is, in fact, and most confusingly, two places by the same name. There's a Krasnogorovka near Avdevka, which the Russians captured in March. And then there is this other Krasnogorovka, which is referenced here. And apparently, way back in March, when I mentioned that the Avdevka, the Krasnogorovka near Avdevka had been captured, I said that my understanding was that this is where a lot of the artillery that shelled Donetsk was based. It seems that I got the wrong Krasnogorovka, the actual Krasnogorovka, where a lot of the Ukrainian artillery that shells Donetsk is based, is the one just referenced by Igor Kimakovsky. Apologies for this, but as I said, maps are not my um, my my uh, strong point. Um, I have very diff very great difficulties seeing and understanding them, and beyond that, I will make no attempt to deny that I often get confused by the identical place names. But there we go. So, Kurachovo, this place that apparently the Russians are pushing towards, Krasnogorovka as well, and ultimately Vugledar. And of course the battle for Vugledar apparently also is connected to this battle for this village Novomikhailovka, which the Russians are now in the process of storming. And there's lots of reports pouring out from Novomikhailovka. The Russians appear to have committed overwhelming forces to capture this village, and it seems inevitable that before very long they will do so. And the point about Kimakovsky's comment about that the Russians have now received an opportunity to advance towards Vuglada, that might in some respects be the key, because up to now, all Russian attacks on Vuglada have come from the south. The Russians uh, were able to capture territory immediately to the south of Vuglada, and they've been launching attacks upon Vuglada from the south and to some extent from the southeast. But Vuglada is a small town of high rise buildings. It dominates the flat landscape around, and the communications lines to the north and east and west through which the Ukrainians have been able to keep the garrison in Vugledar reinforced and supplied have never been broken by the Russians, which is why Vugledar has been, if you like, a kind of bone in the Russians' throne. But now they're in a position to advance upon Vugledar from the north or from the northeast, and also to start to work to sever the supply lines. And this is what Kimakovsky is talking about when he talks about 
blocking several strategically important highways, which are used by the enemy to ensure cohesion amongst its military units and to bring in new manpower and ammunition. And this has been, this isn't a new piece of information. I've been reading reports about the interconnection between the battles for Vugladar and Marinka since uh, the late autumn of last year. Many commentators, Russian commentators especially, have said that it would be extremely difficult to break through the Ukrainian defences in Vugladar without capturing Marinka first. That the battle lines, the Ukrainian positions in Marinka and Vugladar are interconnected with each other. And if Marinka were to fall, that the position of the Ukrainians defending Vugladar would become extremely precarious. And we might indeed be starting to see that. The Russians, as I said, appear to be pushing west. They seem to have reached this village, Yurgevka. <laughs> they may be pushing on further west to Kurakovo. There's all sorts of other places that they're probably looking to capture in this area as well. But it's increasingly clear that the defences, the Ukrainian defences, in this part of Donbass have been pierced and this official of the Donetsk People's Republic government, Igor Kimakovsky, he appears to think that this is a big event and a decisive move. It reminds me, I have to say, a little somewhat like what happened way back in, I think it was May, when the Russians started to capture important villages in the high ground in northern Lugansk region. And that eventually led to the collapse of Ukrainian defences in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk and in other places, and eventually the collapse of Ukrainian defences in that part of northern Donbass, in northern Lugansk region. And if this is correct, then you could perhaps just possibly argue that the fall of Marinka is of similar importance. Anyway, we shall see. But suffice to say that Zeluzhny telling everybody that Marinka has not actually fallen. Um, I've seen his denials reported essentially as fact in some media outlets in the West, including some British ones. But anyway, that is not true. And he is not being um, straightforward with his men by pretending that they're still fighting in Marinka when there clearly isn't. Even more interesting than what Zaluzhny said about Marinka, however, was what he said about Avdeevka. And I am very surprised indeed that these comments of Zaluzhny's have not attracted more attention because they are, to my mind, completely extraordinary. He says that he has just said, and I was wondering yesterday whether he really had said it, but it seems that he did. He said yesterday, at the same comments when he discussed the situation in Marinka, he said that the Russians would capture Avdeevka in two or three months. He said that the Ukrainians will continue defending every millimetre of their land as long as they can, but ultimately they will always place the safety of their people over territory, something which has absolutely not been true in any part of the war up to this time. But anyway, that's what Zaluzhny said. And rather than go on defending Avdeevka to the very last bullet and the last man, they will pull out first 
as they did in Bakhmut and as they did in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk, though I should say he didn't mention Bakhmut and Severodonetsk and Lysychansk, I've just done. Well, all I will say about that is that if I was a Ukrainian soldier fighting in Avdeyevka, a soldier of the 110th Brigade, especially if I've just been receiving the news about the fact that my comrades, the ones who were going to go on Christmas leave, the 108 soldiers that I spoke about yesterday, if I'd received the news that they'd all failed to reach their families and were probably either wounded or dead, if I knew about the horrendous situation in which I am fighting in Avdeevka, being shelled by the Russian artillery every day, being pounded by Russian bombs, which um, fall on Avdeevka on a regular basis, if I was aware of the increasing problems in supplies and communications. If, hearing, knowing all of this, I learned that my commander-in-chief thinks that in two or three months all of this will be vain and that Avdeevka is going to fall, I would ask myself the question, why in that case am I still fighting here? Why am I putting my life at risk? Why am I seeing all my comrades, my friends, the soldiers who serve with me, put their lives at risk? in order to defend a place that in two or three months' time, the Russians are going to capture. I find this comment of Zeluzhny's really extraordinary. And I, I can't comprehend the logic of it. Surely, if he really does think that Avdeevka is going to be captured by the Russians, given that there are massive shortages of manpower and equipment in the Ukrainian army, well, in that case, he should be pulling his troops out of Avdeevka as soon as he can. Alternatively, if Avdeevka is of such enormous strategic importance that it must be defended and that a pullout from it is impossible, and that losing Avdeevka would open the way for a possible collapse of the front, well then, surely in that case, if he knows that the Russians are going to capture Avdeevka in two to three months' time, the right thing for him to do would be to tell Zelensky that the war is being lost, we can't continue longer in the way that we are doing, unless there's some fundamental change in the situation with our Western allies, we should begin negotiations with the Russians right away. And we need, in any event, to inform our Western allies that our Eastern front lines are about to collapse uh, because Avdevka is so important to those front lines that that's why we're defending it, even though we now have calculated that in two or three months' time it will be lost. Anyway, that is not apparently what Zeluzhny is choosing to do. So what explains this bizarre comment, which I have to say I cannot help but think is going to be even more demoralising for the Ukrainian soldiers in Avdeevka, who are probably pretty demoralised and troubled about their fates already. But anyway, what explains this extraordinary, ex very odd statement of Zeluzhny's? I'm going to suggest that it is, again, a further sign that the all-consuming conflict between Zeluzhny and Zelensky has now become the personal priority of each. There is the little matter of the war with the Russians that they still have to fight, though I suspect that in Zeluzhny's case, he probably senses that before long, or perhaps already, all the key decisions are going to be taken by US General Aguta rather than himself. So in the meantime, 
he is prepared to say things which will outmaneuver and put Zelensky on the spot. So Zelensky says that Avdevka must be held at all costs. Zelensky says, well, it's going to fall in two or three months. Zelensky says that it is a place of tremendous strategic significance. Zelensky says, not so. <laughs> we can actually withdraw, and there are other places we can withdraw to. Zelensky is notoriously unwilling to concede ground. Zelensky says, well, ceding ground is not such a big deal. If we pull back and preserve our forces, we can go back on the counterattack and take it back. So we could see that this is again an example of narrative construction on Zelensky's part. Only this time, the target of that is not the Russians, but Zelensky himself. And we could see the same ding dong over the mobilization proposal. So Zelensky comes forward and says, Zeluzhny and the general staff have asked me to call up half a million men. I do have some concerns. I'm not quite sure how all of these men are going to be inducted and what they're supposed to do and how they're going to be paid for. But anyway, that's what we're going to do eventually. We're going to have to call up half a million men. And then Zeluzhny comes along and says, well, no, actually, I didn't ask for any specific number. Um, I did ask for some mobilization, but I didn't say I needed half a million men. I just left the figure open. And then there's discussions about what type of people should be enlisted. And Zelensky suggest, suggests that, you know, Zeluzhny um, basically wants to extend the mobilization pool as far as possible and Zeluzhny comes forward and says well actually none of this is really my concern I am just tasked with managing the war uh, conducting the fighting <clears throat> mobilization questions recruitment questions are really not my province I'm shuffling them all back into Zelensky's line of responsibility so the Mobilization clearly is a hot potato. Um, both Zelensky and Zeluzhny know that it is bitterly unpopular in Ukrainian society. Yulia Timoshenko, formerly, not until, until just a few years ago, one of the leading political figures in Ukraine. She was once Prime Minister of Ukraine. She uh, um, um, worked very hard, as I remember, to become president of Ukraine. She was at one time the most popular politician in Ukraine. She was a leading figure in the Orange Revolution of 2003. She was imprisoned after a trial started by her Orange ally against her when he was president, Viktor Yushchenko, continued by his um, anti-Orange <laughs> successor, Viktor Yanukovych, she went to prison and she was became something of a core celeb, both in Ukraine itself and in the West uh, while she was in prison. But anyway, uh, Dimoshenko has now come forward and said that, well, this whole mobilization that Zelensky and company are talking about is actually unconstitutional. It shouldn't be happening at all. Well, Anyway, I'm not going to get into that discussion about how unconstitutional it is or not. I don't think the, the Ukrainian constitution actually counts for very much anymore. But we can see what a deeply unpopular topic this is and how Zelensky and Zeluzhny are now trying to use it against each other. So Zelensky saying that it's Zeluzhny who's insisting on the mobilisation of half a million men. Zeluzhny saying, well, actually, it's got nothing to do with me. Um, Zelensky saying, I've got to mobilise men in this kind of way, and because that's what Zeluzhny needs. And Zeluzhny says, well, that's actually, again, it's not my concern. This is all Zelensky's uh, um, problem. I mean, I'm just the supreme commander on the battlefield, so I don't concern myself with how men get recruited. So, 
the political conflict between Zeluzhny and Zelensky continues unabated. They're still playing off against each other. They still clearly don't trust each other. They obviously don't work well with each other. In fact, it seems that they don't work at all with each other. And they're constantly at cross purposes. And they are now, in effect, arguing publicly. When Zelensky says something, Zeluzhny comes out and contradicts it. And the comments that Zeluzhny has made about Avdeevka, to my mind, what they do, what they are, is the first time that there is a public issue between Zelensky and Zeluzhny on a matter that directly pertains to the battlefield. So Av Z Zelensky does not want to see Avdeevka fall. Zeluzhny appears to say, well, if Avdeevka falls, which it will, it's no great, it's no big deal. It's an astonishing, as I said, change. It's an astonishing situation. And it must leave many Ukrainian soldiers confused and bewildered. Now, Zeluzhny is not the only Ukrainian general who has been speaking. There's been comments by the other two big figures in the Ukrainian military. Uh, general Sirsky has now uh, spoken. He is the person who is an overall command of Ukrainian forces in the northeast sector, in Liman, Bakhmut, Kupiansk, the Oskol River, he says that the situation remains difficult and um, in uh, all of the areas. And he said that due to the intensive actions of the Russian armed forces, the Ukrainian army is experiencing difficulties in Bakhmut, Krasny, Liman, Kupiansk, and in the northern areas. So that's Sirsky. Very, very difficult time for Ukraine there. And General Tarnaski, who is the person who has overall charge of the fighting in the south, he's the person who supposedly was in overall charge, or at least in direct charge, of the Ukrainian offensive of the summer in Zaporozhye region. Anyway, he's come forward and he said that um, the Russians have become extremely skilled at countering Ukraine's precision guided weapons. I presume he means it's HIMARS and it's ATACMS missiles and those kind of things and perhaps even their drones and um, they're becoming less effective because the Russians are becoming better at countering them. So bleak comments from all of Ukrainians, Ukraine's commanders and the Russians <coughs> pushing forward in um, in Marinka, despite General Zeluzhny's claims, the Russians predicted now to win in Avdeevka by no less a person than General Zeluzhny himself. And the Russians continuing to create difficulties, as he puts it, for the Ukrainians in the north, in Bakhmut, Krasny, Liman, Kupians, and the Oskol River lines. And can I just say, on the Bakhmut situation, there's been actually quite a lot of news. Apparently, um, as I said, the fighting in Bogdanovka is indeed continuing. The Russians, however, do seem to be pushing forward in other parts of the Bakhmut front lines. And they seem to be now definitely edging closer towards Chasov Yar. And it's likely that they will indeed eventually capture Chasov Yar. And that will probably happen at some point over the next few weeks. Now, if they capture Chasov Yar, as I understand it, then we have an interesting confluence of uh, factors starting to play out because Chasov Yar opens the way to Konstantinovka. And unless there's two 
Uh, there's another place, Konstantinovka, called Konstantinovka. It looks as if Ukraine, uh, Russian advances from the Marinka area might also be at potentially affecting Ukrainian positions in Konstantinovka, the Marinka Avdevka areas. And it does look as if the Russians are gradually beginning to home in on that particular town, which seems to be an important linchpin in the Ukrainian defences. Now, somewhere or other in some Western publication, and I've been reading so many of these that it's now difficult to keep track of them, but somewhere or other I actually read a point which I have made many times in the past, that if <clears throat> the Russians succeed in clearing Donbass entirely, in other words, the Donetsk and Lugansk republics, entirely of Ukrainian defense, defenders, if they're able to break through right to the borders of Donetsk region and Lugansk region and eject all Ukrainian defense, defenders from these two regions, if they're able to push them out, in other words, from Slavyansk and Kramatorsk and Pakrovsk and Vugladar and all of these places, and of Devka, of course, it is open step land from then, from there on to the Dnieper. There are some towns. There's a place called Pavlograd, which is apparently an important logistics hub for the Ukrainian military, but it is somewhat isolated and um, it can be easily uh, circumvented. Um, and looks, to be truthful, rather vulnerable. But if the Russians are able to break Ukrainian defences, as I said, it's flat, open land, all the way to the banks, the eastern banks of the Dnieper. And, well, maybe that won't be the end of the war if the Russians reach the Dnieper in central Ukraine. But ever since um, early autumn of last year, I have been pointing out what an enormously consequential event for Ukraine that would be. The Russians do reach the Dnieper opposite Dnepro, the city that the Russians still refer to as Dnepropetrovsk, one of Russia, Ukraine's, and by the way, previously the Soviet Union's great industrial centers. The Russians do reach the Dnieper opposite Dnepro. Then Ukraine's entire position in terms of control of the lands that lie east of the Dnieper, it seems to me becomes extremely difficult to sustain. The Russians could, in theory, push up the Dnieper, up the east bank all the way to Kiev, but also uh, cutting off places like Kharkov along the way, by the way. But also, of course, it would put a tremendous economic stranglehold on Ukraine. And we might be closer to this point than perhaps we've been at any at any other point in the war. This Western publication, which I forget which one it was, but it suggested that um, what we're seeing at the moment, these <coughs> Russian advances, which both Shoigu and Gerasimov have no, now told us are exa active examples of active defence by the Russian army, enlarging their areas of control. Well, that looks like shaping the battlefield, preparing the ground for a Russian offensive, perhaps in the spring, intended to clear Donbass once and for all. And that would, of course, if that happens, open the road, open the route to the Dnieper. And that might happen in the spring or the summer. 
Who's to say? Well, anyway, we'll just have to wait and see. I appreciate that there are other views. Brian Boletic at the New Atlas, for example, still doubts that the Russians are going to launch any big arrow offensive at any time. I am not convinced by this. This attrition strategy that the Russians have conducted in Ukraine has undoubtedly worked very well for them. But I can't imagine that they intend to continue the war indefinitely in this manner, if only because every war has to end at some point in some form of victory. And I would have thought that the Russians would want to wrap up this war at some, with some sort of victory in some measurable time scale. I don't think that they would be prepared to just go on grinding the Ukrainians one village at a time, one town at a time, indefinitely, and just wait for the Ukrainians to collapse. At some point, I still think that some bigger hammer blow will fall. Now, as I said, I think that we're some point away from that point yet. The Russians have to break through the Donbass first. I've discussed in earlier programs, programs I principally did last year, by the way, the difficulties that conquest, capture of the Donbass um, involves, that this is a fairly densely dense region, lots of small towns and um, lots of factories and industrial districts um, interconnected by railways and roads and also with a, a significant system of small rivers and canals tying it all together. Um, a region in some ways very like the Ruhr in West, Western Germany an area which it is easy to fortify and easy to defend. But where <clears throat> that system of defences and fortifications cannot be easily reproduced anywhere else in Ukraine. And I've suggested that once the Russians are finally able to clear the, the Donbass, then, well, I'm not going to suggest that the way for them will be easy or open, but they will not experience quite this intensity of conflict that we've seen in the Donbass itself. And this is the principal reason, by the way, this is the key reason why Ukraine has defended Donbass so tenaciously, why the Ukrainians have been so unwilling to pull back from Donbass, why during the fighting in the summer they continued to commit so many of their forces, for example, to the Bakhmut area, rather than do what the Americans wanted and refocus everything on the offensive in Zaporozhye. It is because the Ukrainians know that if they lose Donbass, well, maybe they haven't lost the war, but their ability to keep fighting, their ability to create other defence lines becomes severely attenuated. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say about the situation on the battlefields today. We see, as I said, the continuing arguments between Zeluzhny and Zelensky, and we see the Russians continuing to press forward. And I just want to return briefly, before I proceed to other things, to the story of the amphibious vessel that was attacked by the Ukrainians successfully in Feodosia, in Crimea, uh, yesterday, which continues to be the topic of a huge amount of attention and uh, discussion, especially in the West, where it is being hailed as some great Ukrainian victory. The Daily Telegraph, by the way, led on the story, and um, I've had, I've, I've read some extraordinary um, 
articles in the British media bragging about Ukraine's achievement in sinking this ship, warship of Putin's, and supposedly doing it with a British missile, a British storm shadow missile. It might, in fact, have been a French scout missile, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, just a few things I want to say. The first is that the British bragging about their role in sinking this warship again does make me think about how fortunate Britain is in some ways that the Russians are such extremely disciplined people and that they're so focused on their objective in Ukraine that they're not apparently particularly interested in striking out at their British tormentor. Presumably they see the British more as an irritant than as a real problem. I say that because with lots of British warships now in the Red Sea and in the Eastern Mediterranean and in the Middle East and with all sorts of people um, who are now in de facto alliance with Russia operating in the Middle East and apparently only too eager, one suspects, to attack and do significant damage to Western warships. If the Russians were disposed to think otherwise, um, it would not be beyond, I would have thought, their abilities to respond, to retaliate against the British in some, shall we say, deniable way in the Middle East. Now, I am absolutely certain this won't happen. I don't think this is how the Russians work. But I really do think that for all that, all of this goading and gloating that the British like to engage in is unwise and reckless and it makes assumptions about the Russian adversary, which I share, but I wouldn't place all my money on. That's the first thing I would say about that. The second is, and here I do completely agree with Brian Belletti, the incident of this attack on this warship again exposes the fallacy that it is possible to cut off Crimea. Um, through the kind of military operations that Ukraine has been undertaking and its Western sponsors have been urging upon it. Now, there's a widespread view that this particular uh, ship, this amphibious ship, was actually being used to carry cargo, to be precise ammunition, and it was because a missile hit this warship, um, which was carrying all this ammunition, that the explosion was so catastrophic causing the ship to be completely destroyed, which is maybe true. I mean, I don't know one way or the other. But what I have been reading is the enormous complexity involved in carrying out this one specific raid. Apparently, all kinds of spy Planes, NATO spy planes were up in the sky tracking where the Russian radar positions were, where the Russian air defence systems were. There appears to have been some kind of attempt, which was successful, to spoof and misdirect the Russians, which is why the Russian air defences were caught by surprise by this attack. But it would be incredibly difficult, massively expensive, to carry out an attack of this kind repeatedly, time and again. One would need hundreds of missiles. Four missiles apparently were launched against this ship by two aircraft, both of which the Russians, both of which the Russians claim they've shot down. A serious attempt to isolate Crimea 
would be would be impossible would be beyond the resources of Ukraine or of the resources that the Western powers could provide to Ukraine. And Ramaletic has often made the point that the Russians have in the past provided supplies to Crimea by sea. And, you know, if the Crimean bridge were disabled, they would no doubt continue to do that. Um, what I think he doesn't always mention is that, of course, most of the ships that provide these supplies to Crimea are merchant ships. Of course, Ukraine and its Western allies could attack those merchant ships. But then, of course, if that starts to happen, the Russians, with their far greater resources, could start attacking Ukrainian merchant ships, Ukrainian grain ships, in retaliation. And far more quickly than a blockade of Crimea, we would in that case actually finally have that sea blockade of Ukraine that people have been warning about for so long. And besides, again, as Simplicius the Thinker has now discussed in a long piece that he's written today, most Russian supplies, at least military supplies, now... Um, pass through the land bridge, not through the Kerch Bridge anymore. The Russians have in fact been building additional road and railway link, uh, uh, link uh, lines through this land bridge. They're apparently about to enter service, or may indeed already have started to do so. This is the major route now for Russian logistical supplies. Ukraine made a major effort in the summer to break the land bridge. It failed catastrophically the chances of it succeeding of a similar uh, of a similar attempt succeeding in the future seem extremely remote so the whole idea of isolating crimea is logically speaking an impossible one now that of course leads to another point because given that all sorts of people, Lieutenant Colonel, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, for example, I believe is one, have spoken about isolating Crimea as being the essential step that needs to be made in order to defeat Russia in this war. Given that in resource terms it is impossible, then that means that Russia cannot be defeated in this war. In which case, more likely than not, if the war continues, given Russia's enormously greater resources, Russia will win. So, why not draw now the necessary conclusions from that and try to find some way out? Anyway, I just wanted to make these fairly obvious points because... Well, why not? <laughs> Let's move on and talk about other things. It is becoming increasingly less likely, with every passing day, that Congress is going to authorise funding for Ukraine on anything like the scale that the Biden administration is proposing. Apparently, Speaker Johnson has hardened his positions further on this issue. And I think the administration was deeply disappointed by the fact that it wasn't able to get a vote authorising an appropriation from the Senate before the Christmas holiday. So it is looking less likely that this is going to happen. And there has now been a whole series of articles, including a very powerful one in, from Bloomberg, one from an important um, um, Nobel Prize winning economist, all of them saying one and the same thing, that this idea of seizing Russian assets and trying to fund the Ukrainian war out of those assets is an absolutely disastrous one. That the 
global backlash against such a move would be so overwhelming and so disastrous for the West, it would completely destroy the West's credit. It would mean that countries like China, Saudi Arabia, the other Persian Gulf monarchies, other countries that place deposits in Western banks, other countries that, or, or Western financial institutions, that all of those countries would make a massive stampede out of those financial institutions because they would know that their money was no longer safe in the West. Uh, it would be beyond a matter of a mere freeze, controversial though that would be, it might actually be stolen. And um, all of these countries would probably rush to join the BRICS and work together to set up, to hasten the work, to set up the alternatives to the US-led and EU-led global financial system. Apparently, so I'm hearing, Western central banks are of the same view. The Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, the Bundesbank, they're all weighing in private, and they're saying, for heaven's sake, don't do this thing. <laughs> now, that doesn't, of course, mean that these warnings will be heeded. Um, I remember in the run-up to the sanctions that the Western powers imposed on Russia in February 2022, the sanctions that included the freezing of the Russian central bank's reserves, the Western, the big Western central banks were all united, for example, in advising Western governments against freezing Russia out of the SWIFT interbank payment system. They had no idea that Western governments were planning something even more extreme, which, to, which was to freeze the Russian Central Bank's reserves. The Federal Reserve Board actually has apparently confirmed that they weren't even consulted or informed in advance that this move was even being considered. But they did all say, don't throw Russia out of SWIFT. Well, the West went ahead, the Western governments went ahead, the United States, Britain, Germany, France, all of them, and they not only threw Russia out of SWIFT, but they also froze Russia's reserves. And the central banks were unhappy about it, and they were also very unhappy, apparently, about the attempts that the United States government started to make later over the course of 2022 to get Russia declared as formally in sovereign default. That never happened. Um, but the key point is that in either, in the key point is that despite all of this advice, all of this advice from the financial experts, from the banking and financial community, Western governments went ahead and did it anyway. So it's possible, it's very possible, that Western governments will indeed do it. Apparently, the United States government, the administration, is thinking of doing it, and I get it, the sense that President Biden himself is keen on the idea. Having said that, there is now such an accumulation of opposition. There's been a powerful article, as I said, on Bloomberg about this. The Financial Times, a couple of, about a week ago, published an editorial basically opposing this move. <laughs> Given all of this opposition, I think that Western governments will find it harder to do this time than they did, than they found it in February 2022, when they booted Russia out of SWIFT and froze its central bank reserves. Well, we'll see whether or not the advice is heeded. But there has been some 
interesting developments along uh, along this issue, which suggest that there is, for the moment at least, little enthusiasm in Europe for this particular venture. And that is that the Financial Times tells us that the EU <coughs> is preparing a backup plan worth, in, uh, worth up to 20 billion euros for Ukraine using a debt structure that sidesteps the objections of Hungary's Viktor Orban about funding the war-torn country. After, and this is, I'm now reading from the Financial Times, after EU leaders failed to agree a proposed 50 billion euro four-year package for Ukraine earlier this month, officials have searched for alternatives to save Kiev from a looming budget crisis if the bloc's differences cannot be resolved. Officials involved in talks said one model funded by debt has gained traction as the most practical way to provide support if Orban refuses to drop his veto at a planned summit in, on February the 1st. The scheme would involve participating member states issuing guarantees to the EU budget enabling the European Commission to borrow up to 20 billion euros on capital markets for Kiev next year. The precise terms are still under discussion and the final amount would be set according to Ukraine's needs. The <clears throat> arrangement is similar to the structure used in 2020 when the Commission provided up to 100 billion euros in cheap financing to EU countries for short-term work support schemes during the COVID pandemic. Crucially, the option would not require guarantees from all the EU's 27 member states, as long as the main participants included countries with top credit ratings. That would allow the EU to sidestep Hungary's veto because it would not require unanimous backing. Some countries, including Germany and the Netherlands, would need parliamentary approval for national guarantees, a process officials hope would be completed in time to provide aid to Ukraine by March. Now, that suggests to me two things. Firstly, that people really do have serious doubts that this 50 billion euro package will be approved in February. Um, not just Orban, but perhaps others, Fico of Slovakia, some other states as well might be unwilling to move forward with that package. And one can see why some states, hearing about this debt plan, might be saying to themselves, well, why should we then, why do we then need to vote for a project for Ukraine, and the smaller states might say this to themselves, when the big states can just issue guarantees allowing the European Commission to borrow money on the international markets to fund Ukraine. So, it might be that they really do think that Orban is going to say no. It also looks... <clears throat> rather looks at this, that some people in the EU are not keen on this Russian asset confiscation idea. Um, most of the Russian assets which would be confiscated are actually located in the EU, principally in Belgium. And they would in theory, therefore, be an easily accessible pot of money if they were to be simply confiscated in the way that some people suggest. But the fact that the EU is coming up with these schemes may suggest that, again, there is just too much opposition to this, to this confiscation idea for it to go forward. That doesn't mean that there aren't problems with this scheme 
also, what is being proposed here is actually quite extraordinary. Now, the German government in particular has insisted for many years that there is to be no debt mutualization within the EU, that Germany will not engage in debt mutualization with other European EU member states, that each state is responsible, solely, solely responsible for its own borrowings. And for that reason, it has set its face hard against Eurobonds. The idea of the European Union, the central European institutions, borrowing money on behalf of the EU in uh, the international money markets. Now, the Financial Times is absolutely correct that during the pandemic, as an emergency measure, this was what Germany agreed to. And it did happen. And Alex Christoforo and I discussed the implications of that on the Duran when it happened. We said that despite all the protestations and denials from Germany, from Angela Merkel, an important precedent had been set. And as night followed day, demands would come for more euro bond flotations, um, like the one that took place during the pandemic. And lo and behold, here we see that another euro bond flotation, this time to support Ukraine, is being proposed. But note the very interesting twist. Because with the previous pandemic, Eurobond flotation. It was an all EU enterprise. In this case, countries, if they choose, can simply opt out. So Hungary won't be involved. Perhaps Slovakia won't be. Perhaps most of the EU states will decide that they don't want to do anything to do with this. You know, them giving guarantees for borrowing to fund Ukraine, for the EU to borrow money to fund Ukraine, that's not what they want to do. It's not going to play well with their electors. So, quite plausibly, they will say no. And some of them will pull out. But we're told that some of the big states will, might nonetheless, agree to go forward with this. Now, which big states? Well, France, possibly. That would be deeply controversial, with, especially with President Macron's popularity very much on the slide. And a general sense, anyway, that he is, his presidency is fading away. Uh, Marine Le Pen... I am sure, would be fiercely opposed to this idea. But, you know, okay, France might decide to go along, Macron might use his presidential powers to ensure that it happens. But ultimately, the key country that would have to do this, have to go along with this, would be Germany. Now, Germany is restricted... <laughs> through various amendments in terms of the kind of deficits it's allowed to run. It's given all kinds of commitments to its people against floating euro bonds. It's now going to presumably carry the major burden in floating a 20 billion euro, euro bond by the European Commission. It's going to provide the critical backstop of that. And, of course, it will need parliamentary approval, which presumably would be obtained. But I can't imagine that it wouldn't be controversial within Germany itself. For the record, 
I would not be surprised, though I am not sure that this is the case, that there might not even also be constitutional objections. I can very easily see how a project like this, an enterprise like this, could be sent to the German Constitutional Court, which has become increasingly assertive in recent years, and which might come back and say, sorry, this, this thing, it, it, it can't work, it is contrary to this law or that law or whichever law. And as I said, I'm not going to anticipate on all of this. But anyway, that's where we're going. It looks as if Germany, which is restricted on how much it can spend on itself or borrow on itself by its own laws and regulations, is proposing, because it's inconceivable, that this project can have been floated without German agreement, is proposing to guarantee borrowing, to stand guarantor as borrowing for borrowing by the European Commission. Not on itself, not for the EU's own use, but for Ukraine. Now, what people in Germany will think of all of that, I have absolutely no idea. But anyway, that's what the Financial Times tells us is coming. Now, 20 billion euros, even over spread over a whole year, is well, spread over a whole year, is going to be nowhere near enough for Ukraine. Um, what would have to happen if the EU were indeed to start making up the difference in terms of the funding that the Americans are providing, is presumably that the Germans would have, and the Euro European Commission would have to come back and do the same thing again and again. So 20 billion euros in March, perhaps another 20 billion euro appropriation in September, Perhaps another one again in December, rolling on, building up a large bundle of euro bonds, backstopped, guaranteed principally by Germany, and of course Dmitry Peskov, Ru Russia's presidential spokesman, he's just come forward and said, well, any money that the West provides to Ukraine it's not going to make any difference. It's not going to change the outcome. So if Ukraine collapses and is unable to pay the lenders all this money, the bondholders all this money, well, who would have to pay for the money? Well, it would be the Germans themselves. The German taxpayers would, in effect, have to pay tens of billions of dollars at a time when, as I said, Germany is going into recession. They would have to pay tens upon tens of billions of dollars for the project, the failed project in Ukraine. To my mind, nothing again demonstrates more vividly the obsessive quality of this whole enterprise than the fact that schemes like this are being drawn up. One would have thought that looking at the situation in the, on the battlefronts, seeing the tremendous diplomatic support that the Russians have succeed, successfully managed to build up around the world. Seeing the alienation of the global south over the Gaza crisis, seeing the steady expansion and enlargement of the BRICS states, seeing um, 
all of these things. And seeing, of course, the military situation in Ukraine, the political crisis in Kiev, the arguments between Zeluzhny and Zelensky. People in Europe would start would be starting to do the same things that some people, at least, in the United States are finally starting to do, which is say enough. Let's not throw more good money after bad. Let's stop here and let's see if there's perhaps some other way out. But apparently, the European political class, the European Commission, the European bureaucracy, the current German government, some other key European governments, the British government, which of course is not going to be a party to this particular device because Britain is now outside the EU, but which will no doubt be cheering it on, and which for all I know will be coming up with further appropriations for Ukraine of its own, despite the fact that Britain is also in a severe budgetary crisis. Anyway, notwithstanding all of that, they're still focused on sending money, throwing money at Ukraine, despite all the indications being that all that money, all that that's going to happen, is that that money is going to be lost, and that the bills will then start hitting the taxpayers in Germany and across Europe when it becomes clear that the Ukrainians are in no position to repay the loans. So, there we go. That is what the European Union is going to do. Now, Douglas McGregor, um, fine commentator that he is, has, I noticed, also taken recently, or no, not quite recently, he's been doing it for some time, of finishing his pieces, his written pieces especially, by quoting again General Rundstedt's words to General Yodel in um, July 1944, when um, the Allies achieved a breakthrough in Normandy. General Yodel telephoned um, Rundstedt at uh, General Yodel telephoned Rundstedt from um, German headquarters. Rundstedt was the officer in command in Normandy and asked uh, Rundstedt, what shall we do? And Rundstedt reputedly, there's some dispute as to exactly what he said. Anyway, Rundstedt reputedly fired back, make peace you fool. What else can you do? Well, I would have thought that we are now obviously and clearly in that situation. And I think, again, Douglas McGregor is absolutely right to remind us of that incident, because this is essentially where we are with this war. It might drag on for quite some time. It may take a longer time than many assume for the Russians to clear Donbass and to battle through to the Dnieper. And then, of course, we don't know what the Russians will do when they reach the Dnieper. Will they want to cross over? Will they advance north towards Kiev? What will they do? We don't, well, there's many imponderables. But as I said earlier in the program, cutting off Crimea, the key to victory, which is what Lieutenant General Ben Hodges tells us, looks impossible. Um, breaking the land bridge, um, well, that has attempt, been attempted and it has failed. The Russians are building up their forces. Quite plausibly, they will continue to grind the Ukrainians down. I and others think that sooner or later they will launch an offensive of some kind. But whatever they do, whatever the Russians do, the trajectory of the war is absolutely clear. So why indulge oneself in these absurd schemes, absurd schemes like this? It does sometimes seem to me as if people in the West faced by the twin horrors 
of a potential Ukrainian defeat or the alternative, an equally horrific negotiation with the Russians, which is something that they just cannot bring themselves to do, are coming up with one bizarre device after another. And this latest plan of floating Eurobonds on behalf of Ukraine is just one. Well, that's my programme for today. There'll be many more of uh, this kind, of course. We'll see what happens over the next couple of days. Um, and perhaps, by the way, over the course of this programme, understating the extent, if anything, of Russian advances. They appear to be getting increasingly fast and increasingly strong along the battle lines. But anyway, this is where I stop. Thank you again for joining me. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble, and X. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video. You can check out our shop and go to find the amazing things that uh, are there. Our Christmas mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, all those amazing things. And I believe that there is a um, that there is a sale, Christmas sale underway. And I believe the discount code is Christmas 2023. But anyway, you can, can probably check that out. And one way or the other, this is as I said, where I end. Let me remind you again, if you've liked this program, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Have a very good day, more from me soon, and see you again.